Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And before we talk to today's guest, who's kind of a big deal, it's a really a big deal, I would be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Scott Todd, from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. And Scott Todd, look, the only way you could close 197 deals last year is if you automate and you automate and you automate. And the way that Scott automates and the way I automate is postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm excited to talk to our guests because I'm really interested in becoming a better entrepreneur and um, a better thinker. And you, you, you maybe, even a better, maybe even a better person. Yeah, you know what I'm interested in? I'm interested in knowing how this one person was able to build up a network of sites to get two and a half million page views. That's a lot of page views. It is. It's I'm, l- I'm lucky if, if uh, my website gets like two. I think you get more than that. Come on. Ten? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Not uh, you two know, and a half million. I'll tell you what, Mark. I, I, uh, I, I felt very, very good. Uh, up until like about 30 seconds ago when I saw the two and a half million, because I was looking at my like Google analytics of my site and I'm like, I thought I was doing well. You know, I was, I've hit five figures a month, uh, five, you know, in excess of 10,000 page views a month. It's not two and a half million. That's what I got to get to. Well, let's talk to our our guests and see how we can get to two and a half million. You ready? I'm ready. Matt Paulson from mattpaulson.com is an entrepreneur, an angel investor, and an author. His largest business, marketbeat.com, makes real-time financial information available to investors at all levels. And he does this through his daily investment newsletter, which has attracted more than 430,000 subscribers. He also has a podcast, uh, the Startup Q&A. Um, but he, his financial news websites attract more than 4 million page views each month. MarketBeat was recently recognized as the fastest growing privately held company in South Dakota by Inc. in its annual Inc. 5000 rankings. Many major out- media outlets have featured MarketBeat's reporting, including Barron's, Wall Street Journal, CNBC, MarketWatch, and Seeking Alpha. However, you know, Matt's also an angel investor. He's got a couple other companies as well. He's got, you know, his books. He's a big deal. Matt Paulson, how the heck do you become such a prolific entrepreneur? Um, I work really hard and I would only do one thing at a time. So I, I figure out, okay, what's the, what's the one thing I'm working on now? And, you know, I, I work on that until it hits its natural conclusion. So it's, you know, you, you look at my resume, my LinkedIn profile, it looks like I've got a stupid number of things going on. But, you know, really I'm only working on one of those things at a time because, like if you look at when all these things started, you know, it's really like one a year. So I kind of pick out one new thing a year and add that to the list. And, um, you know, after a while I get good at it and it doesn't take much time. Like running the angel fund maybe takes two hours a month. So it's looks really impressive on paper, but it's, you know, there's not a whole lot of time that goes into it. How did you learn to do all this stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, it really started, you know, probably when I was like 10, um, I wrote HTML, um, when I was a kid, uh, made a little website for myself and eventually I made like a website about SimCity and um, you know I was getting maybe 25 page views a day when I was in like seventh grade in the 90s um, for my website that's uh, SimCity 2000 cheat codes and uh, um, I, I really cut my teeth on some of the basics then and um, you know I, I went to you know I went to college I got an undergraduate degree in computer science so I learned all the stuff that I hadn't learned by myself before and I um, just got a really good technical understanding of you know, how web programming works and then just kind of intermingle that with some good business and marketing knowledge. And it's just a very dangerous combination of skills put together. That is dangerous. Matt, tell us a little bit about your parents. What do your parents do? Uh, So they are, my dad's retired now. He was a police officer for 25 years. And my mom was a school librarian for many years. And right now she does HR at Walmart and she's, you know, they're both in their mid sixties. So they're getting ready to retire, but they both had blue collar jobs and, you know, nothing that was all that remarkable or exciting. But, you know, one thing that they, they did that kind of set me up for success as a child was 
Um, we were one of the first five families in our city to have cable internet. So we had cable internet in the year 2000, which was probably, you know, four or five years before everyone else had it. We had a home computer, which most people didn't have. Um, in eighth grade, I got a computer in my own bedroom, which was just, you know, um, you know, really set me up for, um, you know, I had pretty much unlimited time then. And I had a device that was connected to the rest of the world. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on it. I learned a lot. And, um, you know, those you know, years of just exploration of the early internet, um, you know, ha have paid off some, some pretty big dividends. Scott Todd. Well, you know, Matt, one of the things that you said that I really, really liked is the fact that you're working on like one thing at the time, mm -hmm. at a time, right? Like, I think that a lot of people, they, they think like uh, serial entrepreneurs or, um, you know, they, they think of like Jack uh, Dorsey, you know, Twitter and Square, and I can do all these things and I can be as successful and I can run these massive companies. Yep. When in fact, it takes a lot of work to just do one thing. Yep. And, you know, do you see that a lot with entrepreneurs that you're talking to that they're trying to do all these things because they want to blow up and scale up right away? Yeah, that is, uh, that is kind of one of the top five mistakes is working on two or three different big projects at once. Um, you know, starting a business is just a crap ton of work. It's a lot more work than any of us realize going into it. Um, it's a 40 hour, 50 hour week thing for a couple of years. And if you're not willing to put that into one business, then it's probably not going to be successful. So if you try to do kind of a half-hearted job on three different businesses at once, it's just, it's not going to get very far. Um, yeah. You know, you know what I kind of thought was really interesting, Scott and Matt, is that Matt's parents, um, weren't sort of like the Sherpa of his success in a way. And so often um, we don't see that a lot where you kind of, you know, sort of blend into your environment, right? So it would be really logical if Matt became a firefighter, right? Or a teacher or- I would suck at those things. Yeah, but you know, instead his parents kind of said, hey, it looks, looks like Matt's got some unique skills and he's interested in computers. Like, let's go ahead and foster that right yep. where um you know i i you know it's like do you ever see that documentary up do you guys ever see that scott you saw it yeah yeah I'll show them up. yeah yeah so it's like it's an interesting idea of like you know what you're born into it's really tough to get out of those situations um mm -hmm. and uh but matt what would you say the, the the greatest lesson was that your your parents taught you you know it was you know they did they did a really good job of fostering my interest. Um, you know, they, I had like half the amount of money I needed to buy a computer. They loaned me the other half and, you know, they didn't really have the money to do that, but somehow they, they found it. So um, they, they recognized that I had an interest I had and, and a talent with, you know, technology. And, you know, they really did the best they could do to foster that. They made sure I got into all the good computer classes in high school. They, I think there was some kind of camp that they sent me to that was, I don't remember what the details were, but uh, you know, for computer stuff, um, they you know they they saw the interest, they saw the talent, and they didn't try to foster me into being anything that they wanted me to be. They saw, hey, you know, our, our child is interested in this. Let's um, enable him or encourage him to to follow his own interest and talents. Um, so many parents have like the, the desire to live out their childhood dreams to their own children, and my my parents didn't do that. Like, you know, my my dad didn't put me in little league because, you know. He wanted to do really well in baseball. It just they they didn't do that. I, I really appreciate that about them. That's that's huge. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, it's like Mark. I know, like with my own son, he's got interests that are not necessarily mine. I, I'm sure your your children are the same way. You know, like they've got interests that you're like, where did that come from? Yeah. But um, if you can just like just support them in some way, you know, you're not sure where it's going to end up, but you could you could create someone like Matt. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole kind of Montessori teaching style. It's, you know, what are the children gravitating to and encourage them in that? And, you know, my kids are four and one, so it's kind of early to do that. But if the kid wants to play Legos, it's all right, let's go play Legos. I'm not going to force you to go play something else. Yeah. And now that education is so abundant, there's sort of no excuse anymore of not being able to learn something that you're mm -hmm. interested in. Um, that, that kind of is gone, like where it used to be, Hey, you'd have to have some kind of, you know, connections or you'd have to have some type of, you know, innate talent maybe. And then, you know, someone would kind of, you know, like the Medici's, like they would kind of be like your, 
you know, your, your benefactor, if you will, and kind of support you. Um, I mean, today you want to take a class at Stanford, take a class online at Stanford. It's not cost you anything. Um, it's, it's almost like to really be successful in, in the upcoming years, you have to learn how to learn and love to learn and, and be curious about that. So, so Matt, um, if we're going to extract your success, Mm -hmm. right. And you're going to say, okay, this is why I've been so successful. And this is sort of my killer, um, competitive edge, right? Yeah. What would you say? It's, what, what do you say it would be besides hard work? Well, I, I really think it is. I'm willing to outwork people. Um, and how, how, okay. Then how do you do I'm that? I'm willing to do it for decades at a time. So I have been working at least 50 hours a week for the last 12 years. Um, I started this, you know, my business, my first business was when I was in college. Um, so while everyone else was, you know, partying on a Saturday night and you know, not working too hard in their classes and, you know, playing video games after that, everyone else was playing, I think, Halo 2 on Xbox 360 um, in our dorm. I was the guy, you know, sitting on a computer in my dorm room writing blog posts for my personal finance website. So it's, you know, not only was I, I willing to outwork people, it was, I was doing it at a point in life when other people didn't think working that hard was all that important. Um, and I was, I, I could even go back into high school. So just, you know, I, I wasn't working like a hundred hours a week, but you know, I was working, you know, on my stuff, um, you know, probably 30, 40 hours a week, you know, in, in high school when everyone else was doing high school stuff. So it's, uh, I think you know, start, I'm 31 now. Um, Obviously, I've had a lot of success, but I mean, this is a journey that probably started, you know, 15 years ago now. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Now that you're an angel investor, what do you what do you look for in an entrepreneur that you'll, that'll say, okay, mm -hmm. you've written, no, not only do I like your idea, but I like you enough. I'm yeah. going to put some money towards it. Yeah. So, um, in our angel fund, there there's a few criteria we look for. Um, you know, one, we look for scalable companies because, you know, the assumption is seven out of the ten companies we invest in are going to fail. Um, so the three companies we have have to really make up for that, up for those losses. So we want, you know, companies and people that can really grow something to seven or eight figures in annual revenue. Uh, we are looking for people that are local because this is a Sioux Falls, South Dakota angel fund. It's not a California angel fund. And, you know, I assume if somebody's coming to me from California asking for money, um, they tried to raise money in the Valley and it didn't work out. So, you know, why the heck are they calling me um, if, there, if there's all that money there, but for the person, yeah. Um, you know, you know, we, we understand that business ideas, business models change. The first thing you start is not going to be what your business ends up as. So you're betting on the person, the team, as much as they are, um, as we are for the idea. So, you know, I'd rather bet on the, the, the right person in the wrong race than the wrong person in the right race. And, you know, one, one really early flag that kind of, you know, sets people off. It's like, you know, we tell people to apply on Gus, which is kind of the platform we use to manage our deal flow. And the people that, see, you know, the deal seemed to be going well are the ones that had no problem doing that and they just did it right away and, and were responsive to that request. And you know, the, the, the people that, you know, just can't seem to throw an online application for the life of them, even though we're going to give them $100,000, um, you know, those are, those are the people that don't seem to have their crap together um, with uh, uh, when they pitch or even like when we look at their deal. So it's, you know, really responsiveness to our, you know, request is really kind of an early indication of whether or not this person has their crap together, which in turn will help determine if their business is going to be successful. Um, I mean, if you have to ask somebody for something four times and they don't do it, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big red flag. So that's kind of the first thing that I look for. And then it just, you know, after that, it's, um, you know, do they seem like they have their stuff together? Do they understand their industry? Do, do they know enough to know the, what they don't know or to maybe a better way to put that is do they know enough to recognize there are things about their industry that they don't understand and are looking to figure out or are they the people that know everything um, or think they know everything already and the people that think they know everything already are, are typically the ones that are, are going to get into trouble because they don't like think that oh this giant company that's in the same space I, I'm in maybe they want to tackle the same idea and people that, that set aside those um, you know, notions of there are other people working on this too, or you know, just people think they've got all their stuff figured out and aren't going to, you know, accept that there's something out there that they don't understand. Um, um, that, that's also a red flag for me. 
Lack do, of humility. Go ahead, Scott. I mean, do you, do you think like, like I came from a, from a large company mm-hmm. and, um, you know, one of the things that I continued to hear all the time is you know, like we, we worked in a space where there was a lot of startups, but not necessarily direct competitors. They were indirect competitors. They, they wouldn't do like car sharing, ride sharing kind of a thing. Sure. And, you know, the one thing I, I continue to hear is, um, oh, well, the big companies, you know, they're, they don't have the, the, you know, the desire or they don't have the intelligence to go do, do this stuff when, in fact, we, we did and we had the capital to do it also. Yep. Um, and I think that what's funny about, for, for me, what's funny about that is that, you know, there's books that are written about, oh, how, how large companies can't pivot and large companies can't get into new, new spaces or new technology. But you know what, it, it, I think that's very naive because I've seen firsthand that large companies can and will and will, will either buy you up or, or, or kill you yep. <laughs> one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, there's so many stories of Microsoft in the 90s like, trying to buy out companies. And then when they say no, then the Microsoft just goes into, went into that same space and just killed them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you, you can't be, you can't have too much hubris and say, you know, these big companies are clueless because, you know, they've got, you know, eight, nine figures of capital at their disposal and can buy all of your competitors and just crush you if they want to. It's like they don't have to get everything right. They can throw enough money and people and resources at something where even if you have some secret sauce, it won't matter because, um, They've got, they can just kill you with the amount of resources they have and are willing to throw at something. And I'm guessing that any big company is going to need to be, be less, can be less profit, be not, not profitable for a lot longer than you can be. You're going to run out and of it, money and they'll just consider, you know, a sunk, you know, a sunk cost. And yeah. And that's the thing is like, they, they can, like you can, the money that a small company might, might uh, lose and it might be a big deal to a large company. It could be, a, yeah. you know, a few executives pay mm-hmm. and like, it just goes on under, under the radar as operating costs. It's like, it's not even hitting the radar yet. So yeah. It's a rounding error. Yeah. It's a rounding error. Right. Mm-hmm. So Matt, how can Scott and I get the 4 million page views a month? Yeah. So what I figured out that nobody else figured out until I started talking about it and made the mistake of talking about it was um, I figured out that there is an entirely different kind of SEO ball game for news about publicly traded companies. So there are lots of places that have news about, you know, say Wells Fargo or Apple or Bank of America or whoever. Um, Yahoo Finance, MSN Money, StockTwits, Twitter, um, they all have vertical searches for news about publicly traded companies. And I figured out, you know, I could get into those places and, you know, the way that you do it in each of those different vertical search places is different. But we started producing content at scale using a technology that we have developed in-house about seven years ago to create um, financial news stories based on um, structured financial data. So that probably doesn't make any sense to anybody. But um, if you think of how you know the game Mad Libs works, where you fill in words and you get something really funny at the end, we kind of do something very. I mean, that's a very basic version of what we do. But it's like say this company announced their quarterly earnings. They announced this much per share, they had this much per revenue. And you know, that goes on for about 400 words. You do that a thousand times a day over, you put it, you know, you put it into these different financial search vertical platforms, you can do really well. And we've done really well with that. Genius. Now, was that, was that on uh, Planet Money? Did, uh, were you so guys they, featured on Planet Money? Uh, we were not. Um, Automated Insights were, which is a company that's doing something similar, but we started probably four years before they did. And if I were were a smart entrepreneur, I would have patented the idea then and there, but um, 20 some year old Matt didn't think to do that. So there, that cost me probably $10 million. That would have been a very valuable patent, but. uh, Because Mark, in this one Planet Money episode, they they actually show like, hey, here's the, um, here's the content that a writer wrote and here's the content that the artificial intelligence wrote and you really can't tell a difference. Yeah, you can't. Um, Yeah, because. Yeah, their story was about the Associated Press and they're using automated insights technology to create those articles, but we were doing it four years before they were, or so I saw that announcement, it's like, ah, welcome to the party. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah it's, it's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's the best time ever to be an entrepreneur. But so Matt, if we, if we rewound the tape, right? And you were going to give young Matt some entrepreneurial advice, what would you tell him? Yeah. I mean, if I were starting over today, I would definitely not like, like what, 
my business works because I started it, you know, eight or nine years ago. It, it wouldn't work well today starting from scratch because, you know, the stuff that's out there now that I'm doing that the AP is doing is so good that it's, unless you've got, you know, eight years of runway to work on it or you're the Associated Press, it's, it's hard to come up with quality content that that's this good. Um, I, I probably wouldn't even tell somebody like me to try because um, the people in um, mostly India, Pakistan that have tried to copy my business, um, they just, they, they can't replicate the software. Um, they just haven't been able to do that. And like, if I didn't have it now and I didn't know exactly how it was done, I don't think I could do it again. Um, like if I had been working on something else for eight years, it's just, it's that complex. So I, I think I would, if, so like in my other businesses, um, they're kind of based on kind of outbound marketing strategies. So like, I think, you know, SEO today is kind of a, a game that's just too hard to win for anybody that's not going to be the SEO guy 24, seven, 365. So I'm, I'm really bullish about, um, you know, direct email marketing stuff, like with Google photo contest, the, the, our only marketing strategy is emailing animal shelters and saying, Hey, do you want to run our photo contest fundraiser? Most organizations like yours will make five to $10,000 doing this. And we get a pretty good response, right? I mean, we run four or 500 contests a year with animal shelters around the country. It's a little business that makes a quarter million dollars. And, you know, there, there's no SEO involved. There's no Facebook ads or Google ads or any of the strategies that anyone else is doing. Um, just the fact that we found a database for animal shelters and took the effort to email them, you know, maybe once a month, which I can call it spam, but like who's going to get upset about one email a month? Yeah. Yeah. So, but what, is there any other entrepreneurial thing that you would change from, from the very beginning? I mean, any mistakes that you, you would say, Oh, if I just did this differently, yeah. things would have been better. It's, I mean, I'm 31 and I make like two and a half million dollars a year. So it's hard to say how, <laughs> how good this is. <laughs> um, no, um, I'm pretty happy with how the last decade's gone. And I just can't look back and say, man, I screwed that up. I mean, I got sued once in the last decade over a non-compete agreement. I probably would have handled that a little bit differently. Um, I've had a couple of companies threaten to sue me over some stupid stuff I probably shouldn't have done. Um, but I mean, there's nothing that was like derailed me for six months of my life. I love it. I love you know, it. I, I think that, you know, I think that um, what, what's kind of funny and one of the things that you, you said, Matt, and, and I don't know if you meant it this way or not, but you said like um, you had figured out the, the algorithm, if you will, that, um, that publicly traded companies had a different search engine optimization SEO type of um, uh, rating, right? And then you said, you said uh, but then you started telling everybody, would, would, you, would you go back and not and like keep that close to the, to the chest or, or does it really not matter because of where you've made it in your yeah, business? Yeah, so, so at first, like, at first, when I first saw people starting to compete with me, I, I thought, crap, I should have shut up about this. Um, but then I actually built some indexing tools to say, okay, what percentage of these vertical markets do I own versus these other guys? And I realized that, and, you know, some of them, I probably had like, you know, 20% of stories in one of the vertical search engines are mine. And then on like the next guy was like 3%. So it's like, well, you know, he's probably taking some away from me, but it's probably not going to be it's probably not a huge percentage, but uh, I, I think definitely, I mean, the cat's been out of the bag for five years now. Um, I, I probably would have kept quiet, quiet about it, frankly, um, for now today, but you know, what can you do about it? I don't have a time machine. Uh, you know, Mark, it's, it's funny because, and the reason I asked that question is because I was talking to someone the other day and they were telling me about a, a uh, marketing tool that they were using to sell land. And then after they told me, they're like, oh, I shouldn't have said anything to you because you know, you're, you're probably going to start using it. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I mean, I have my own little, little uh, place that I, I sell in. I mean, we all know it's this little place called Craigslist, right? Like it, to, to me, it's, it's a good place, but I kind of had to laugh because, you know, it's, it's like, it's going to get out, right? Like there's no secrets. I mean, there's, it's, anybody's going to figure this out at some point in time. Yeah. And, um, you know, may, maybe you, you should enjoy it until the word gets out a little bit and then just embrace it and move on. Right. Um, but that, I, that really comes back to like, I guess the, um, you know, the abundance mentality. Yeah. Not, not only that, like if you only have a business that is successful because nobody else knows about it, it's, it's not a very good business. Uh, your competitive advantage shouldn't be that it's a secret business. It should be that you're better than everybody else at what you do. Yeah. I like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Matt, 
this has been really great, uh, but now we're going to put you on the spot. All right. And we're going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? And you guys, uh, when you asked me at the beginning of the show if I had any questions, I probably should have asked that question. Um, hold on a minute. Let me, let me pause this for a second. I'm going to go back to my startup Q&A list and see what my best idea was recently. All right. Awesome. Mark, I'll tell you what I've been doing. Okay. Tell me. All right. So this is a little bit of a hack and I got this off of one of our podcast tips, but I got to tell you, it's been, it's been pretty uh, cool is there's work that I want to get done uh, in with, with like someone based in the U S you know, we typically hire uh, VAs off of Upwork or other places. And the tip that was given was, Hey, go, go to like the Philippines Craigslist and find, check the resumes. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I've been doing that in my local area and I've been scanning and it's amazing to see how many stay at home moms are looking for work that they can do at home. They're U S based. They, they just want flexible time that they can do the work whenever they have the time to do it. I've replied to some, and they're putting these in the resumes section on Craigslist resumes. And it's amazing the talent that you can get to do stuff as long as they can work on their own schedule. You know, when the kids are taking a nap or the kids are out, of whatever. I've been very impressed with this in the last couple of weeks. Very cool. That's a great tip. Matt Paulson, how about your tip? Yeah, uh, to follow up on that, I mostly only hire local people that like live in a place where I can come find them. Um, <laughs> like my actual two employees that both live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and they're both, you know, women that um, one's a mom and one just is a housewife and they both wanted flexible work and they're both good at what they do. And that's, that's been two very good hires for me. Um, so I, I definitely recommend stay at home moms on Craigslist as a way to find people. Um, there you go. So, so my tip, um, I've talked about this a couple other places, but is to, um, there's a new technology called web push notifications. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. Sure. Sure. So we've gotten about 51,000 people to sign up for them on our website. And every time we send out a notification, we get about 2,000 clicks. So it is just an amazing little technology um, inside the you know, desktop web browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Um, if you go, so if you go to like marketbeat.com, you'll get asked. It's like, do you want to allow this website to send you push notifications? And there's a button that says allow or block. And if you click allow, you know, that website, regardless if you're on that website at any point in the future, can send a notification to your browser. So you could say, hey, check out my new blog post and you could be on, say, ESPN and you would get a notification from MarketBeat saying, hey, come to MarketBeat and check out this um, new story. Um, so it is it's a really, I mean, it's kind of like email and that like you can just, um, you know, hit, up, hit people up whenever you want to. You don't have to wait for them to come, at, come back to your website. And it is a little bit more ephemeral, ephemeral people, you know, um, people that subscribe, they can become unreachable and you just can't push to them again. But uh, it's a, you know, after email, it's, it's a very hot marketing tool that most, almost nobody is using for one, but two is just, it's, it's so powerful. I mean, I've got advertisers paying me, you know, a dollar fifty two dollars a click on some of these things. So just the fact that I send out a notification for them, you know, I get 1500 clicks that say two bucks a piece. You know, I make three grand from sending out a push notification for an advertiser. And that's just because I thought to start collecting push notification subscribers and they didn't. Wow. Now, are you using a particular company? Like uh, I've looked at push crew. Yeah. Yeah. We use one signal and Oh yeah. Can, I'm looking at one signal right now for uh, WordPress. Yeah. So I, I like one signal there. Use Like we just use their API to like send notifications through their system. So we primarily use them as, as an infrastructure provider and they're very good for that. There are tools to manage like your messages and view the stats and like schedule them. The U, I mean, it's all there. It just the UI isn't as good as it can be, but we don't really use it. So it's not a factor. Um, I know I a lot of people use push crew and there are a few others like that as well. They do the same kind of thing. Um, one mistake though, that people make a lot with it a lot. Um, so like if you sign up for push crew, it'll have like the push crew, they'll, they'll have their own version of the allow deny thing. And then that'll take you to another page that shows the actual allow deny thing built into the web browser. Um, don't use those intermediary things um, that, that, you know, let you do custom messaging. Um, once you add that second step into it, it will, it, it, it will really hurt your opt-in rates to these things. Um, you really want to have that built-in browser accept an I button that works a lot better than the in intermediary, you know, pop-up buttons that they give you to opt-in or not. Uh, very cool. The only Ooh, requirement for that, 
I guess all is done, but the only requirement with that is you do need to have a, an SSL certificate on your website. So you need to have that be HTTPS enabled, but you should be doing that anyway now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, fantastic. Well, I just uh, activated my one signal free web push notification on my site. Awesome. Um, great tip, great tip. Yeah. Um, my tip of the week, I think is better than everybody else. Is tip of the week, because it's learn more at mattpaulson.com. Mattpaulson.com, we'll have a, uh, a link to it. Um, this is great, this is great. Matt, do we, is there anything we, we didn't ask you we should have asked? Probably. <laughs> what, what, what should we have asked you if we didn't ask? Uh, I don't know. I, I've got a lot more tips like that. We could go on for, for hours with stuff I've been learning in the last six months. All right. Best, best three tips last six months. Go. Okay. So push notifications is definitely number one. Number two would be using Google's structured data testing tools. Um, so with websites now, the, the big trend with Google is they're – they are really paying attention to schema.org information on your website. So it's basically a way to provide Google with structured data. And there are two of their specifications. One is the schema list and one is the schema question. If you have HTML that's formatted in the way that they want it, um, you know, when you Google sometimes now, it, it tries to show you the answer right at the top of the page without you clicking on anything. Okay. You can search result. Um, marketers call it position zero. But if you set up those schema questions on your website, um, you know, sometimes you can get those spots and, um, you know, we rank zero for a, a lot of questions and it's, um, you know, that's been a very nice little source of web traffic that, you know, again, not a lot of people are doing yet. Structured data testing tool preview, a free Chrome extension. Do you recommend getting the, the Chrome extension? Uh, it's not, uh, I just use, they have a website URL for it. Okay. So if you look up like the schema.org question specification and, and you put some of those questions and answers on your website, um, Quora does this, then you can, you can get some of those positions, your spots. And it's um, some really good traffic because you know, you're going to be at the top of the page. Ah, I love it. I yeah. love it. Um, okay. So I'm going to my site right now and I'm going to say, test your structured data, run test. Yeah. And you'll probably say nothing. Cause you'd probably like, unless you've intentionally set it up, it will come back as blank. Well, no, I've got something here. Oh, cool. Uh, I have zero error, error, zero warnings, but it's all, it's, I don't understand how to read it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it, 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 it's, there's a learning curve to it, definitely. All right, well, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Um, second, third, that's your, you got two tips. Now, what, another one. Boom, sure. go. So, uh, no, no pressure, Matt. Go. Sure. So if you are writing an email to say, you want your audience to do something, you have an email list, send them a, a, a literally a two sentence email. The first sentence is a question like, Hey, are you still interested in X, Y, Z question mark? And like, if you are comma, click this link. So it's that, that type of email, um, digital marketer calls, calls these are like a nine word email. Cause there's nine words in email, but the, the open rates tend to be very high. People actually read them to take action on them because it only takes like a second to read and they get through pretty much every spam filter in the world. So when I send out like a nine word email, my open rate tends to be about 30 to 40% higher than normally is. And the click through rate tends to be usually about twice as good as it, good as it normally is. And it's just cause it's short, it's concise, but gets through every spam filter in the world. People actually take the time to read it. Then if they're interested, they'll click and take action. So you know, great tip. Said, you don't have to write like a four paragraph email because who wants to read a four paragraph email anyway? So keep it really short and sweet. So do you do this for all your emails? Because I write like five emails a week. No, it's uh, it, it's something to pull out of the hat maybe once a week. Um, once a week, okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it for everything. Um, but it's, when you got something simple you want people to do, like read an article, you know, it's you know, a really nice way to get people to take action. Yeah, are you interested in dominating Craigslist? Click here. Yeah, I mean that it doesn't have That's to be That's really good. That's really good. More yeah. complicated than that. Boom. I'm I'm going to start doing that. I'm doing that today. I'm no, Scott, right. I, I'm doing it today. No, no, I'm doing it right now, Mark. I already did it. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. <laughs> no, you didn't. Trust me, I can see you. Fine. I can see your screen. Fine. Fine. I've, I've, got, right. I've got two more of these if you really want. Let's go. Two more. Come Let's on. go. Matt, right. we, we love it. We're, we're sucking out all the genius from Matt Paulson. In fact, yeah. um, after this podcast, I'm going to have you on speed dial. All right, so two more. One is the Accelerated Mobile Pages Project, Google AMP. Um, oh, do I go to Google AMP? 
Yeah, um, just yeah, Google Space AMP. Okay. And this is a specification for like really mobile friendly news content or and they're expanding to e-commerce and a bunch of other spaces now. But it is a kind of a subset of HTML that's supposed to load really fast on mobile web browsers. And if you do it, Google is right now, they have what's called a search carousel where they're giving people that have this AMP friendly content, um, you know, kind of an extra position on top in mobile and get a lot of free page views. We're probably getting about 10,000 page views a day from our AMP stuff from people on their mobile phones searching for stuff on Google um, that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So it's been a nice little traffic source. I've had my developer make really mobile friendly AMP pages that, you know, have our, you know, normal ads in them or normal email opt-ins, but it just looks really good on a phone. So one, it's creating a good experience for your users, but two, Google is also sending you more people because you're doing what they want you to do, which is to create these really nice, fast mobile web pages. Wow. Um, I love it. Yep. I love it because, you know, I've got an app right now for the Land Geek. It's not that good. I think this could be better. Yeah. I, I think most people that want apps don't need apps. If you've got a website, you probably don't need an app. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, okay. So awesome. So that was Womp Mobile. Or no, AMP. Want mobile? Okay. Google um, AMP, AMP. Google AMP. Okay, so maybe I went to the wrong place because I went to. It said beautiful Google AMP development. Yeah, um, yeah, that's probably a service for AMP. Oh, ex okay. So I want to go to the AMPproject.org. Yeah, AMPproject.org is the the site for it. Got it. All right. Okay. Well, one more, last one. Um, so there are. You know, we all have websites um, and most of us have no idea how people are actually using our websites and interacting with them. Right. Uh, so there could be a whole bunch of people that are getting stuck on one part of your website. They don't understand where, the, where to click. And if you had moved the button around, and if you knew where to put the button, then you could get much better results and get people to take the action that you want them to. And the way to um, really figure this out is to use a technology called session replace. So it literally, um, records what users are doing on your website and how they're mousing around, what they're hovering over, um, you know, what they're clicking on, and just kind of replays like what they were doing as if you were standing behind them in their room as, as they were on your website. Uh, there are a few services that do this. Clicktail is one of them. Mouseflow is another. Hotjar is one. I think we use Hotjar on our website, um, but it actually records those sessions and those mouse movements and what people clicked on when they did and, um, so that way, if people are getting stuck on your website or like on the landing page, especially, and they're not taking the action that you want them to, you know, maybe the button's in the wrong place. And, you know, if you watch several of these session replays and you see um, people make the same mistakes over and over again, um, and you can know that you probably have a user interface issue. Yeah, Mark, yeah, I, cool. I, I actually used Hotjar on my, my Landmoto site, and mm -hmm. it was amazing because I had a slider, you know, like that would just change out the pictures, but I only had one picture because I didn't want to have it show. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, arrows on each side of the picture. And what Hotjar showed me is that people were actually clicking on the arrows, even though they're, I mean, the arrows were there, but there was no other content. There was nowhere else for them to go, but they were clicking on the arrows. So I'm like, wow, that's pretty powerful to know that people are looking for more pictures, more stuff. And uh, I mean, it's amazing what like a hot jar can, can do to tell you the story of your user experience. Matt, how many users do we need to have click around before we know, okay, this Not is many. an issue? Not many. No, I mean, you just, I mean, how many session replays can one person realistically watch? If somebody spends a minute on your website, you're going to spend 100 minutes watching 100 people on your website. I mean, right, right, exactly. The, the heat maps, the heat maps were the most important for me. Yeah, that like, was, because that was the heat maps... It, it looks at where the mouse is going, where the cursor's going, mm -hmm. and it records it. And, and then it shows you like, this is where people are taking the mouse. And then you can put, put that content over there. So do you guys like hot jar over everything else? Um, I wish I had a good answer for this. I actually delegated it to my, one of my employees and she's been messing with it and I haven't. Okay. All right. Well, cool. I liked cool. it. You know, we could take it fancy hands and say, Hey, Hey, of these heat map companies, which is the best. Do some research. Yep. Okay, so Matt, any, any more tips? Uh, I think that's it for now, that you guys basically heard half my conference talk at MicroConf <laughs> next week. So. This is great. great. That is great. Well, thank you so much.
I would remind the listeners, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Matt Paulson at mattpaulson.com to come on this podcast is if you do us three little favors, you go, you subscribe, you rate and review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review at supports at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Just want to remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the Langy. Because look, and Matt will agree, you can always make more money, but you can't get more time. So start automating. Automate the Craigslist postings, automate your Facebook postings, automate your life. Right? Scott, are we gonna we should write a book about this? We should. Yeah. We should. You know, Ari Mizell took a great title, Less Doing More Living. It should be something we'll, we'll, we'll like rip it off like let's do the art of automation the, yeah the, yeah the art of living better i don't know matt you like that yeah i think there i think there's a book there or just stuff that everybody does that can be automated that uh i mean like anybody that that still pays their bills like when writes out a check they're they're idiots because like <laughs> I, I mean i tell you if anyone, who's, if anyone who's doing errands anymore like yes. i do everything on amazon and online they're shipped app i mean it's unbelievable uber Uber Eats. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, I live in a town of 150,000 people. We don't have all that cool stuff, but. Oh, it, it'll come to you, man. The drone, I read today that, that now drones, like they're, they got drones that will bring you cash. There's no reason to go to the ATM anymore. That would be a fun drone to shoot out of the sky. And yeah. Yeah. No, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that on, uh, I forget where I saw it, but yeah. Uh, hunt, that's, I think. Hunt, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's so cool. All right. So Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Matt Paulson, are we good? Yes, I think we are. All right. Well, again, I want to thank all the listeners. Scott, you ready? I got anxiety, but let's go. Let's try. One, One two, two, three. three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Matt's like, I really regret now coming on this podcast. Yeah. He's shaking I, his head. I have no idea what that was about, but I, I could have <laughs> that's, that's, that's our tagline. That's Go how to- we end every show. It's terrible, but it's awful. Then maybe you should change it. <laughs> but it's working for us i think yeah. we have people talking all right okay. man when, when are you coming back on because we, we love the tips we love the geekiness um i don't know ask me again in six months and i'll probably say yes awesome all right man thanks so much scott thank you thank you listeners and we'll see you next time all right thanks guys